you know, arthritis is one of those things that we kind of talk about, but uh, there's lots of different types of arthritis. And so I thought I'd kind of go through this a little bit. We'll talk about the anatomy, the joint, and some non-op inoperative strategies. But remember, once you go to an arthro like a joint replacement, you can't go back. So I think it's important to talk about things we can do to avoid getting there. And we kind of understand that the shoulder is a ball and socket joint, but it's a very unstable ball and socket joint. So a hip, socket, stable. Shoulder, it's one of those joints that's almost more like a, you have a plate of bone. So it's a unstable joint because the glenoid or the socket of the shoulder is relatively flat. So this joint not only is unstable, but it's also the most commonly dislocated joint, and Yanni will talk about that a little bit later, but it's not really a true ball and socket joint. And the reason it becomes a ball and socket joint in a way is that the labrum adds about 50% of the depth of the socket. There's a negative pressure in the shoulder. Uh, there's a, this adhesion, the fluid kind of holds it in. And then you have this re relatively wonderful kind of capsule and ligaments and muscles that all function around the shoulder. So for the shoulder, we're talking soft tissues. It is a soft tissue joint. And there are four rotator cuff muscles, and I love that in clinic, and you guys have heard it too, and God bless our patients that have rotary cup problems, or you know, you hear all this when they come in, and I, I still get a kick out of it. But there's four muscles that make up the rotator cuff. And you don't tear muscles really in the shoulder, it's more of a tendon injury, you're gonna tear your tendons. That's because they're the relatively avascular structure. You don't really get rotator cuff tears in people under the age of 40. That's kind of one of those misnomers. I mean, you can, but most of the rotator cuff tears occur in people my age. So a 55-year-old and uh, something occurs, and I'm in this boot now, and I'm eating crow, because last year Jeff Stone fell and tore both of his cuffs, and Mark Frankl has both of his shoulders replaced, and I was feeling young and sprightly because I didn't have any orthopedic injuries. Here I am. So uh, let's talk about function, and, we, and, and I thought John, that was a wonderful lecture that he gave. This is, look out for this girl, Coco Goff, you probably saw her in Wimbledon, probably the star of the summer. Uh, she followed the playbook of kind of the uh, Williams sisters, you know, and, and she beat one of them. Thing that's interesting, she started playing tennis when she was really little, and in our shoulder course this year, we got a guy named uh, Epstein who's coming to talk about range. I don't know if you guys knew this, but Roger Federer didn't really start playing tennis until he was 18. Uh, so he was really good at sports, but he didn't start when he was a little kid. So the question then always becomes, you know, how do you oops, get, get good at a sport? And so if you come to our shoulder course, you can listen to Epstein give his uh, lecture. So let's talk about uh, elevation. You know, when you lift your arm up, one third of the motion is from your shoulder blade, not from my ball and socket joint. So even if you have arthritis, you can still lift your arm up, the ball and socket joint seizes up, much like a car engine, it stops working, but you can use your shoulder blade to elevate your arm. I kind of like this, get to the, uh, the barnyard or into the garage and kind of like figure this out, but this is what the muscles do, so you're kind of trying to figure, the rotator cuff compresses the ball in the socket so your deltoid can work. But all arthritis isn't the same. Uh, and so there's different ways to treat it. But I think the biggest mistake people make is that you have an arthritic joint and they go, hey, don't use it, mistake. It's actually quite the opposite. If you have an arthritic knee, an arthritic hip, an arthritic shoulder, you wanna exercise, you wanna stay active, you wanna keep moving the joint, it's really counterintuitive. There's a lot of supplements that are out there right now. You know, I kind of, my best friend growing up lives in Colorado, uh, you know, and all these different kind of things. He's, he likes allopathic medicine, so turmeric. It's, it's this, you know, you can take it with pepper. It's, it's a natural anti-inflammatory, um, the glucosamine chondroitin sulfate. And we heard about that a little bit earlier. But I think that it's important to start these supplements early before the arthritis gets too bad. We can inject the shoulder, and we've talked about that, but the most important thing I tell my patients is keep exercising, don't stop. I didn't even know what pickleball was. This is the goofiest game that has come up, but it's very pot, it's like all the rage. My, my patients come in and there's like tournaments and you know, leagues, and it's crazy. So let's talk about arthritis. There, all arthritis is not the same. There's lots of different types of arthritis, and some of them are systemic, meaning it's not just the joints that are involved, it's the entire patient. So the most common is osteoarthritis. This is what we see in our practice, but rheumatoid arthritis is out there. This is Phil Mickelson. I think he has psoriatic arthritis, but these inflammatory processes affect the entire body. And before we had these disease-modifying agents, these were really sick people. Now they're out doing great things, but it's amazing what a medication can do, and it has eliminated those patients' need to go to the orthopedist. They go to the rheumatologist. Uh, there's rotator cuff arthropathy, where you have failed cuffs. 
Uh, you can get AVN from traumatic type problems or drinking too much or too many steroids. And unfortunately, a lot of cancer survivors get AVN because part of the regimens for cancer treatment oftentimes involves high dose steroids. You can see septic arthritis from infections, and that's really not quite as common. But but one thing I want to show you here is this is a way to get a, a proper x-ray of the shoulder. This is what's called a true AP of the shoulder, so you can see the joint. And you can see on the x-ray picture, this is an obliterated joint. So then we can look at CT scans, and they add a lot of information for us. So I think a CT scan with arthritis, it's not necessarily the MRI. But with arthritis, I like to see the CT scan. Rheumatoid, the joint is destroyed. Before we had these medicines to stop it, it was this synovium just ate into the cartilage, ate into the bone, it just destroys the entire joint. And these patients would end up in wheelchairs and crippled by the time they were in their 40s. Luckily, that isn't the case today. Uh, rotator cuff arthropathy is something that we used to not be able to treat too well because we didn't have means to do it. Now we have newer shoulder arthroplasties that can deal with it. Avascular necrosis, still a problem, very painful. They don't do as well. If I replace a shoulder on someone with AVN, they're not as happy as my other patients. They still have problems. And so I think this is kind of, let's see that, that is actually a surgery that was done in the 1970s. It was called a Dutois capsulography. You took a big roofing staple, you nailed the subscap to the glenoid, no more dislocations. But in fact, the problem with that is people got arthritis later in life. This is a uh, non-union, meaning the bone has not healed. This is a challenge for us to treat uh, because the bone in some of the older patients no longer can be fixed. The, the blood supply has been compromised, so you'll probably go to an arthroplasty. So let's talk about evaluation exam. Yanni did a wonderful job. I thought I'd show this because this was me. Well, not really me. I'm not Kevin Durant. But you could see that his poor Achilles tendon just ruptures, and there it goes. Poor guy. Um, and so Kevin Durant also talking about uh, Prince George's County. My wife is from Greenbelt and John's there. Kevin Durant grew up in the area. He could only bench press about 100 pounds at the combine for basketball. Everyone's looking at him like, this guy's not going to be a great basketball player. So let's talk about physical exam. We, we had Yanni do a beautiful thing. I like to get photographs and videos of my patients that undergo arthroplasty. But the problem is what Yanni alluded to, that you, you try to do the passive motion. With arthritis, it doesn't go. Arthritis, the joint seizes up. You have basically a square peg in a round hole. Doesn't work. So most of the motion is coming from the shoulder blade. So you can do surgery. And so everyone comes in, everyone like is, this arthroscopy is kind of what people want to talk about because it sounds like, you know, it's, it's outpatient, it's easy, you know, I don't have to have a big operation, I don't need my joint replaced. But it really doesn't do too well for pain relief. So you can scope someone's shoulder who has arthritis, but it's really never the greatest answer for me. And I rarely do it these days. Sometimes you'll get a younger patient, but the recovery is a lot more difficult than they might imagine. Uh, it's not going to solve the problem of the loss of the cartilage or the irregular joint surfaces. So I would tell you that that's probably not a great idea. And don't encourage your patients to have that, because most of the time it doesn't work too well. Arthroplasty is across the board going to win, but it's a limited time. So it's like buying a car. Once you do your arthroplasty, you've got 15 years. And if once you get to the end of that, you're going to have to have a really big operation. So we like to put that off till later. Sometimes in very old patients, we'll just cut the shoulder out. People like, oh my god. But if you have someone who's sick, not healthy, can't rehab, that may be an answer in a resection. Or maybe it was an infected case, an infectious arthritis. And finally, fusion of the shoulder. The only time we really do that is when the nerves don't work. When your electrical wiring system is gone, I, I said the last three I did were from young men who were jilted or, or their girlfriends cheated on them or something happened terrible and they were going to kill themselves and then they shot themselves with a shotgun in the shoulder instead. And that takes out the nerves, you confuse the shoulder, and all three of the guys that I've recently done are back working. One guy works fixing jet skis, so he's, he's better. He's found a nicer lady this time. So let's talk about uh, uh, arthroplasty. So arthroplasty is really gold standard. And what we have to look at when we're doing our exam is what's the status of the rotator cuff? Because in osteoarthritis, you've got a great rotator cuff. In fact, it almost protects the rotator cuff. We know that patients who have osteoarthritis have a 5% chance of having a rotator cuff tear by the time they're 60, whereas a normal human, like this guy, Dr. Papu, uh, uh, probably has about a 60% chance of having a rotator cuff. So the, the arthritis itself protects the rotator cuff. Rheumatoid arthritis, they, they tend to get rotator cuff tears because it's a destructive process. And then in traumatic cases, uh, the rotator cuff is scarred. If I broke my shoulder falling on the, like God forbid I fall off the stage, but if I broke my shoulder and it healed, I'm stiffer. 
And those patients don't do quite as well with the traditional total shoulder arthroplasties because they're stiff. So there's 10, you don't have to write this down. This is just more of a surgical thing, but I always make, uh, like you have to have either a 10 or 12 step program for most thing in life. This is how you do a total shoulder, 10 step program. But I think that uh, the, the main thing is that anything we do surgically, we have a strategy when we go about it. And so first we want to make sure we get adequate radiographs. We want to make sure we get adequate CT scans. And then this is kind of what we do. I mean, this is arthroplasty. What's amazing is that this is actual surgery, very little bleeding. You know, what's amazing to me is it's, it's unusual that I'll ever have to do a transfusion for a shoulder replacement. But the key to doing a shoulder replacement is really seeing into the socket. And we do a series of retractors, but when we're done, you can really see what we have to do when we're doing this procedure. Most of our implants these days, if you look to the, to the left of this, or it's on the right up here, but we're using titanium stems, cobalt chrome balls, and we still use a plastic socket that gets grouted in. Uh, the reason it's a little quick is I had monster energy that morning, so I was a little faster doing my surgery, which uh, helps to get done quicker during the day. Um, so I think that glenoid exposure for us as shoulder arthroplasty surgeons is really what's critical. And so that is what makes us better. So, you know, if you do, so I do about 250 shoulder replacements a year, so I do this all the time. I mean, I really do basically two operations at this point. One is a shoulder replacement, the other is a rotator cuff repair, so I can keep it simple. Um, but, I, you know, you, we have to get this exposed, and the way we do it is by putting these retractors in to kind of see the socket. So we use these large homans and these instruments to really expose the glenoid. And it's almost like um, a Chinese finger trap. If you put too many instruments in, it gets too tight. And I had a Chinese surgeon with me, and I was like, you know, I was like, Dr. Wong, you know, you don't want to put too many in. It's like a Chinese finger trap. And he goes to me, what's a Chinese finger trap? So I didn't realize that uh, Chinese finger traps are something that's almost like French fries. I think it's pommes frites, right? So, you know, I said, no, you know, like little, and he kind of looked at me like I was crazy. But when we're doing this, we want to have the, just enough retractors to see it. And usually it's about three. So you can see right now we're using an electric cautery. So all this is done with an electric knife, and, and, and that keeps the bleeding down also. And you're going to remove the inflamed synovium, the inflamed capsule, and we put these retractors in, and we gradually remove all the diseased tissue while maintaining the muscles. So we're taking out the lining, but not the muscles. And we have our retractors in and we work till we can see. And it's usually three retractors that we have in. So in the end, we have this nice exposure. We can see the glenoid and we can place our shoulder arthroplasty. So the other thing I wanted to talk about a little bit is that this is a traditional shoulder arthroplasty, but for you guys, probably only 30% at this point of the shoulder arthroplasty is done or the traditional shoulder arthroplasty because of the reverse shoulder. So the reverse prosthesis is what we use when the rotator cuff is bad. So the reverse is much more versatile in the sense that I can do a total shoulder for an anatomic shoulder replacement, but the reverse will work for a deficient rotator cuff, for a post-traumatic case, it'll work for a revision case, it'll work when you have bone loss of the socket, it is much more versatile, and 70% of the shoulders done in the United States are now reverse shoulders. And the other thing that I'll mention about this is that with my traditional shoulder arthroplasty, I'm a little bit more concerned about my post-operative care. Traditionally, we've done six weeks in an immobilizer. Now with my reverse shoulders, after two weeks, they can start using their arm. I don't send them to therapy yet, but I let them take their sling off, they can go to the shower, they can, they can bathe, they can drive their car, they can play on the computer, they can do all of those things because it is relatively stable. It's a much more stable design, and if in fact I did repair the subscap and it failed with a reverse shoulder, it won't be a problem. If I do a subscap and it fails on a total shoulder, it's a real problem. So the reverse shoulder, can be done, and some people are even doing it now in patients over 80 because they don't want to have to have those individuals be in an immobilizer for six weeks. Because whether you're in an immobilizer for six weeks or a boot for three months, there's nothing worse than crawling into the shower in the morning to get ready for work. And I had to learn about that, which was a kind of a, a unique experience. So this is a reverse shoulder. It's a long delta pectoral incision. We expose the shoulder. We do the head cut. We remove bone. But I think that at the end of the day, whether we do a reverse or an anatomic, the glenoid component becomes the most important of all, okay? So another thing that is really important is rehab. For an anatomic total shoulder arthroplasty, your physical therapist is your best friend. 
You, you, my patients like their therapist more than they like me. They'll like say, oh, I saw John or I saw so-and-so. And they, because you guys spend a lot of time with them. All the physical therapists out there do a great job. And, and the patients really kind of bond. And they hate it when they transfer to different therapists. Like the biggest thing I hear as a doctor is I was seeing John and I saw Yanni last week. And Yanni didn't know anything about my case. They love seeing the same, same therapist. They don't like it when they get bounced around to different people. So when I have patients, I, I try to have them go and kind of get a relationship with their therapist. But I think it's very important. The one thing we're protecting is that subscapularis repair. It's very important to protect the repair of the subscapularis, and you don't want them to do any really heavy lifting until three to four months out from their operation. And so, you know, Basically, the first day after surgery, when I say we begin therapy, it's really uh, uh, elbow, wrist, and hand motion. Uh, and then at the two weeks for my reverses, I'm letting them do computer work. I can drive their car. Uh, with the total shoulder, I'm a little bit more stringent. And then at three months, you know, we're basically kind of getting them going. So I think that uh, in general, it's a wonderful operation. Like anything in life, unfortunately, there are complications. And so just briefly, uh, infection is very rare. But one of the things that's very important, and, and this goes for all surgery, I have my patients use benzoyl peroxide wash because you know the, the acne that lives in the skin and that bacteria is more common in shoulders, but I, they just go to the drugstore and get it. But if you have surgery on, on your shoulder, your face, your head, neck, benzoyl peroxide wash is wonderful. The actual incidence in shoulder replacement is one of the lowest because it's a very vascular uh, area. It's less than 1% the infection rate uh, in shoulder arthroplasty. Loosening happens with time. So loosening usually starts to happen around 15 years unless you're very aggressive. And then finally, dislocation can happen. Usually that happens early when you don't follow protocols. Nerve injury, thank God, is very, very rare. And finally, some people get stiff, and I think that's not proper rehabilitation afterwards. So in any event, I thank you very much uh, for listening. And we're going to move on to talking about the instability of the shoulder. And I'm going to be able to have Dr. Papu come back up here and, and, and talk to us about that.